anguished cries, pleas for mercy from God. An Israeli strike has just killed at least 11 Palestinians, many of the victims' children. Whilst international efforts focus on averting a possible war with Iran, Israel's war in Gaza continues to take a devastating toll. They were just playing on the street and having fun, says this distraught man. The area was meant to be safe. Israel has withdrawn the bulk of its ground forces from Gaza, but it's continuing to launch what it describes as targeted strikes on Hamas. The country's leaders are still weighing up how to respond to this weekend's barrage of missiles fired by Iran. Prime Minister Netanyahu told new recruits today that threat and the threat from Hamas are one and the same. But it's Palestinians who are being killed. This the aftermath of a strike in Rafah, where around half of Gaza's entire population is now living and which Israel is threatening to invade next. We began following 13-year-old Abdullah shortly after Israel's war on Gaza began. Forced to flee again and again, he's now in Rafah, selling sweets to try and help support his family. I never thought I would sell chocolate to make a living. I used to study in a professional school. Now there's no school, there's nothing. Just selling stuff for living to make it out of this hell we are in. Abdullah hopes to become a computer programmer one day, but the conflict has left him facing an uncertain future. From a student to a seller. Why? Why? I didn't choose this fate. Nobody chose this fate. Israel chose this fate for me. In Rafa, on the border with Egypt, there's more food available than in the north, where levels of hunger are highest. But here, too, prices have soared, and business for Abdullah is slow. This is the entrance of the building. Abdullah's family were displaced first from Gaza City, then from Khan Yunis. But anywhere in Gaza can be targeted. In front of the building, I'm in. This place was bombed. The sound was so, so scary. To, to the point I thought, I'm just going to die. It's the end. Hanging over Rafa, the threat of a major Israeli offensive, one that Israel's allies have warned against, but that Netanyahu's government looks to be preparing for as talks on a ceasefire with Hamas break down. Exhausted by months of war and life in tents, large crowds of Gazans have in recent days been trying to return to their homes in the north though Israel has said they will not be allowed back yet. Abdullah too dreams of seeing his home in Gaza City once again, if it's still standing. But it's getting out of Gaza completely that's at the forefront of his mind. If I had the chance, I would leave Gaza. This is just unbearable. I love Gaza. I don't want to leave Gaza, but this life, it's unbearable. You can't bear with this life. Nobody can bear with this life. If you would ask them right here, right now, if you would leave Gaza, they would. But for most in Gaza, there's no way out. And in Rafa today, more pain and grief as another family prepares to bury their loved ones following another Israeli strike. Tear-filled eyes ask when will it all end? Well, the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who has now taken a call from Rishi Sunak, Downing Street reported this afternoon that the Prime Minister had reiterate, reiterated Britain's steadfast support for Israel, but when it came to striking Iran, said that now was a time for calm heads to prevail. Well, Secunda joins me now from Tel Aviv. What more do you know about the discussions within the Israeli government about that decision to hit Iran? 
Well, Chris, the war cabinet, the Israeli war cabinet has been meeting today for the third time in, in, in three days to discuss exactly what to do. Apparently, one key member, Benny Gantz, wanted to go ahead and strike directly uh, against Iran over the weekend itself. But now there are reports that Israel is looking at targeting Iranian proxy forces in the region uh, rather than the country itself, that uh, Israel has reassured Arab countries in the region that the response will not place them in the firing line. So the, the mood, mood music seems to suggest that there won't necessarily be a, a, a massive escalation. But this is certainly still a very dangerous moment. Israeli officials certainly do feel pressure to respond with uh, quite some force. And there's still a, a real international focus on, on calling on Israel to act with restraint. David Cameron, the German foreign minister, are going to be uh, visiting here as part of those efforts. One quick mention of another impact of the tensions with Iran. It's been reported that Israel uh, was going to start ordering people in some parts of Rafah this week to begin evacuating ahead of an offensive. Uh, but now they've delayed that decision. Israeli officials telling me today, though, that those evacuation orders will come soon. Sekunda Kamani in Tel Aviv. Well, as politicians and the Israeli military work out their response, Israeli society also seems divided on how best to react to Saturday's missiles. For the families and supporters of the campaign to bring home those taken hostage on October the 7th, the Iranian strikes have further complicated hopes for any deal to release their loved ones. I've been speaking to some of the protesters and the father of one hostage who was taken on October 7th. At the He's to Blame protest camp outside the Israeli parliament in Jerusalem, there is a small constant watch of those who want the hostages back, Netanyahu gone, and the war with Hamas and Iran stopped. First, that the prime minister is off. We had from him enough. He's a bad man doing damage to Israel to Jewish people, all, all well, to, to the good name, if there is one, for the Jewish people and the Israelis. Do you think Israel should retaliate against Iran? Why, what, 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 what will happen later? What, what, what can we gain out of it? If they think that the Iran, Iranian will uh, be afraid of Israel, I don't believe so. At Hostage Square in Tel Aviv, there are many who feel the same way. The first thing has to, that has to be done is to give, uh, bring them back. Uh, unfortunately, there is a price. Yeah. And the price is uh, sending back... All the Palestinian prisoners? The Palestinian prisoners, which are, uh, you know, some, many of them with blood on their hands. But there is no other choice. But the hostage families are on the political left, the right, and the fringes. Zvika Moore's son, Itan, was taken from the Nova Festival on October 7th. Have you heard anything about him since? Yes, we heard. We, we, we got a uh, live signal uh, before, the, fa before the, the first uh, deal with the Hamas, and now we don't know. The family come from the Jewish settlement at Kiryat Arba and believe Israel should fight and kill its way to victory. I think uh, uh, we, we have to do uh, a great war, okay? We have to continue the war as it was in the first three months. And go into Rafa and continue of course, the same way? Yes, of course, of course. Not only to save my son, but to, to save the state of Israel. They start the war, they have to pay. And I'm sorry, I don't want to kill kids, babies, uh, women, I don't want, but I don't have a choice. I have to protect my nation, my state. And so if that means killing women and kids, then... Yeah, yes, of course, because we don't have another choice. But women and children are not in control of what's going on, yes, of Hamas or anything like there, that. They're the ones who are suffering. But we have there our, our children, babies, okay, women, elders, okay? What would United Kingdom do in our situation? How important do you think it is to get the aid into them? I think that uh, a war is uh, between collective and collective. Now we are in a war 
that they were started, okay? So I have to let me my people and you will get the aid. I think that we, we, uh, we had to starve them, okay, until they, gi they will give us our people. Right now the Israeli government's trying to decide what to do about Iran. Do you think they should hit back? They, they shoot at us because they want to kill us, okay? So they have to pay, not only for us, it's for you too. And do you think your son would agree with you? Yes, 100%, because I raised him, I educated him, I know exactly what my son is thinking. Well, earlier I spoke to the former Prime Minister of Israel, Ehud Barak. I began by asking him how Israel should respond to Iran's strikes. Mr. Barak, first of all, what should Israel, what should Netanyahu do about Iran? Should Israel hit back? Oh, Israel will find some way to, to hit back, but that's not the, the issue. Uh, it should be, uh, Israel should equip itself with uh, strategic patience. It, uh, we, should, uh, we should have no compelling imperative to immediately uh, respond or to have it a very great uh, b volume. The essence of it that we are not interested in a regional war. A regional war that will drag Iran into it and probably Hezbollah into it and the Houthis and the uh, 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 Hamas in, in, in Gaza and the others in the West Bank are still all around and the Hezbollah in Lebanon. That doesn't make sense for Israel. <laughs> it's the wet uh, dream of our enemies. So we should calculate very carefully because we made mistakes in assessment of the enemy twice in this last uh, year, in October 7 and once again in the 1st of April when we, uh, Israel hit this, uh, this uh, general, Iranian general in, in Damascus. So why, we why do you think that was a mistake? No, it, it, uh, I, I don't say that the, to uh, kill him is a mistake. I say that to, to be unable to predict that it might cross certain line that will coerce the uh, Iranian leadership because of the humiliation, if not uh, anything else, and the arrogance that came out from here. But the, the fact that he, the Iranian response to such a magnitude, an unprecedented kind of a missile attack on Israel, is something that has not been predicted. So we should not make the third mistake and calibrate a response that in timing and place and, and the way it's executed, cause a regional war because we don't have an history. It's a wet dream of our uh, opponents. So we have to find a way to look at the wider picture, to see that the priorities are now the following. The hostages should be released. Gaza should be ended. A, a certain ceasefire should be achieved in order to uh, enable uh, calming down the uh, friction in the north with the Hezbollah. And only then the time might have come to, to uh, respond to the Iranians. It should not be a, ahead of everything. It should be at the right and proper time. And so the Gaza war should end now? It, the Gaza war should end now? Not, not now. I don't know if it's now. The focus should be on the deal. And the deal might need certain ceasefire, but if it needs certain ceasefire, a short one or... or, or medium-sized one, that's something that should be considered very seriously. Because the real priority, look, uh, sometimes we hear from our own government that uh, a absolute victory just behind the court. That's not true. It's a hollow, hollow uh, slogan. Uh, if you think about Operation Rafa, it might take a, a month just to uh, push out uh, or pull out to some other uh, alternative place uh, about a million of uh, refugees in Rafa. And then if I take as a president what happened in Khan Yunus, it might take three, four, five months to, uh, to, to end the job in Rafa. So by then, some five or, or six months from now, we won't have a hostage anymore. Probably all of them will be uh, all, only a body that to, could be taken in coffin. So that's a priority. We have to do it. Then we have to end Gaza. And then we have to make sure that if, if a ceasefire emerges, it will enable us to calm down the north. And all these are ahead in terms of urgency of the uh, response in Iran. Iran 
failed in such a dramatic manner uh, uh, in uh, 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 two days or three days ago that uh, it's on itself, it's, it, it gives a direction to them. I know that you want Netanyahu gone, but isn't the fact that everything you are saying is the opposite of what he is likely to do? He wants to finish the job in Gaza, he wants a war in the north with Hezbollah, and he wants to push the Iranians oh, back. I, I want to end all of this. He wants probably to continue. I want to end all of this, uh, and uh, in a way that will uh, give the Israel the right uh, ob uh, satisfying its objective. Our objective is basically to make sure Hamas cannot reign over Gaza and cannot threaten Israel from Gaza. But the right uh, attitude to it is to join hands with the Americans. It was true five uh, or six months ago, but it's true as well now, to sit down behind the closed door with the Americans, with the neighbors, and uh, put a plan. Israel suffered in the last six months from strategic paralysis. No strategic decision was made. No uh, a single decision about what will happen the mor morning after. So uh, Netanyahu finds itself that even the steps that were taken, we pulled out a division some 10 days ago from Gaza. It was not used as a leverage for the hostages deal. We tripled the amount of humanitarian support. It was not used as a kind of a, a jeton, a chip in the negotiation with Hamas. So somehow the clumsiness of the strategy, absence of any strategy, especially the uh, absence of the choice. Are we saying yes, but to Biden and go together with this impressive regional coalition, including the uh, uh, Brits, not just Americans, and we are thankful to the British people for this. Uh, this impressive coalition should be the focus of what Israel tried to stabilize rather than to destroy and join the two uh, extremist uh, messianic uh, uh, ministers uh, in his uh, government who are uh, extracting him. Just finally, yeah. the British Foreign Secretary is coming to Israel. Right. The German Foreign Another Minister one. is coming. Do right. you think these countries have made a mistake in helping Netanyahu? Are they now propping him up no, and I, giving him a win? No, I, I see... What would you say to Britain? I would say the following. I notice in the Americans, and it's probably the same with Cameroon or with the, the representative of Schultz. It is not done for Netanyahu. They, they, they make a separation between the public, the people of Israel. Biden is committed to help Israel. He's not committed to say Netanyahu. He's not doing it because of Netanyahu, but in spite of Netanyahu. He's totally uh, uh, kind of uh, you know, frustrated with Netanyahu. I think that the same happened to Cameron, the same to Scholz, to any uh, uh, reasonable observer in the free world. But Israel is still there. Netanyahu is not Israel. He's not even the commander in chief. He's a legitimate uh, a, a prime minister, but one that behaves in such a bizarre way that we do not support it. Uh, he lost totally the trust of the Israel people, not just of me. Four out of five Israelis say that he is the main responsible for the blunder of October uh, uh, 7th. Uh, three out of four Israelis say that he has to resign. You, you come from the Great Britain. In the UK, he would have resigned October 8. If he, if he wouldn't, his ministers, his cabinet minister would have taken it into a proper club and he would resign after the lunch. Ehud Barak, we must leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.